Hi, this is Brennan Davis from Bedrock Games and the Bedrock Blog, and I'm here with Adam Balderstone for another episode of Bedrock and Balderstone, and we're continuing our discussion of Farscape Season 1. We're going to be talking about Episode 10 and 11, that's um, They've Got a Secret Until the Blood Runs Clear. Um, I guess we'll start with They've Got a Secret, Adam. What's the, uh, what's the rundown of this episode? All right, so uh, Dargo gets ejected into space while uh, going around Moya looking for any uh, Peacekeeper components that might still be there. And uh, that leaves him in a really delirious, uh, delusional state where he seems to be living out uh, scenes from his past. Uh, at the same time, Moya starts acting very strange from that point, and the ship kind of is uh, acting in a sinister fashion. And, uh, you know, uh, Crichton becomes concerned that perhaps there's a, a virus of some kind that's infected the ship. And uh, that's the setup, and it goes from there. So what would you think of this one? I thought this was a very surprising episode, actually. At, <laughs> yeah, first, at first, I was like, oh, man, this is one of those kind of episodes, isn't it? Like, I kind of, you got the, like, okay, everything's run amok, and now we have to repair it. It was kind of like the, you know, like, oh, what's what's the, the biomechanical virus? Oh, no's. And, uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's also, it also, at first, you're like, oh, it's also kind of a, very, it's it's the first true bottle episode of the, of the series, too, where not only does it all take place on Moya, it only has the main cast. Like, yeah. no one else ever shows up in this episode. But... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, uh, but once once they started delving into Dargo's past, that got quite interesting to me. Um, mm-hmm. And so I was, I, I really enjoyed it as soon as that, that started to emerge. And I also liked the twist of Moya being pregnant and, you know, the, just the, and, and, and that, that, that the, the, the the peace was it peacekeepers or peacemakers it was, uh, peacekeepers pe- peacekeeper yeah. the peacekeeper symbol was there as a way of preventing the pregnancy it seemed if i understood the the the, the plot correctly so i i quite liked how because it was to me it kind of reminded me of 2001 because oh they had yeah because they had to shut down moya's brain was the original <laughs> thing but then that turned out to be the absolute last thing that they should have been doing and, <laughs> and and it turned out that she was pregnant so it kind of brought like the star baby together with the 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 sort of uh removing hal's brain components thing um, yeah well, and, yeah the, the scene the scene too where they're just kind of whispering around the table about you know or, or Crichton suggesting the fact look you know i think Moy's trying to kill us that that had a very 2001 yeah. vibe to it definitely yeah so i, yeah. I, I really i i mean the, the the reference was clear as day but it couldn't have felt different it felt more no like it was, it's nothing like 2001 yeah. ultimately <laughs> but but the pieces were there and it was kind of nice to see them like once i saw the baby i think and the reason why is i think when you see when that when, when that reference resonates the same glow you get from 2001 kind of fills you up a little bit and i thought yeah. that was very effective given the that, that this was supposed to be because it's a really ridiculous idea the ship having a baby right so <laughs> so 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 that they were able to make the episode so emotional was actually quite impressive i thought um yeah you know. yeah it's uh no i mean farsky is really good at evoking like classic science fiction things but not feeling derivative it never feels like oh we're just do- i mean well i get you know i i guess going back to iet that's one of the criticisms that it's like oh it's just kind of yeah you're doing an et episode or whatever yeah. but for the most for the most part the show is very good about not falling into that trap of just kind of going through the motions when, yeah. when it uh, evokes something. Yeah, because it doesn't feel like they're taking the structure. It feels like they're taking these key things and just kind of getting it to kind of resurrect that mood uh, in the mm-hmm. viewer. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think it really works. And I thought that the stuff with Dargo was great. I, I really, I think what what solidified it for me was the moment he had with Rigel, actually. Um, when yeah. he thinks Rigel is his son and Rigel's kind of confused. <laughs> I, I, I... Number one, I was sort of wondering, is there going to be residual emotion on either of their parts from this? But uh-huh. but number two, I just thought it was a really great way to reveal Dargo's past because I was not expecting it to be the story we got. I, I was really expecting something quite different from this. Um, yeah. And yeah. And it's, you know, things earlier in the season uh, kind of resonate differently when you rewatch the show, too. I mean, the, the episode we have, you know, where where 
he 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 he's he's happy living on the planet as a farmer and just having this normal life. And at the end, he has that conversation with Zahn about you know how he that's a life he really wanted. That was like a real dream of his, not just it wasn't entirely an illusion for him. And and you know Zahn's comforting thing is, oh well, you're young and you can still build this and everything. And it's like when you know that it's like. He already had this, yeah. and it was stolen from him. And he's he's just not willing to talk about it. It, it gives that that scene a much darker edge. Well, and the reveal about his wife's race was yes. Because yes. at first I was like, um, what's what's the what's the name of his species again? They're um, uh, wow, I'm drawing a complete blank on this. They're uh, oh man. <laughs> Hold on, I'll get it. I'll get the information. Yeah. Um, the uh, I apologize for putting you on the spot with this. No, one. it's fine. I, Luxons. I, I, Luxons. 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 Yes. A, so I was imagining there was some sort of bizarre Luxon custom that prevented him from being with another Luxon. Do you know what I mean? Like that's what I the whole time leading uh-huh. up to this, like I was like, okay, maybe like maybe or maybe it was a custom that we have. Maybe it was something related to like ancestry or related to um you know some other thing that would make their their marriage not kosher. But I assumed it was probably some sort of ridiculous custom that didn't really have any moral weight, but had tradition behind it somehow. And yeah. and that it was that that that, she, that that his wife was a sebation, and that that she was killed by her brother for you know making the race less pure. That was a number one. It, like a, a lot of times in science fiction, you will have the sort of Nazi uh, character sort of as as like a as a as a space species right like you'll have sort of the characters that are they're all about the purity of the race thing right but i don't think i've really ever seen it explored in this way at at the kitchen table level do you know what i mean like (laughs) yeah it it was a um it, it it really kind of opened up both of those groups and it opened up like exactly what the what the peacekeepers are all about you know and and, uh, and, and I mean, and they've mentioned it in the past, but it just never felt as personal. Um, and so, uh, and, and it just makes you see Dargo in a totally different light. Um, yeah. So, because uh, see, I mean, Dargo is obviously a character that needed that to an extent because he's, a. Uh... You know his, his his demeanor on the whole. It's easy to he's he's an easy uh, character to kind of push against a lot of the time, or to come off as you know, not quite the bad guy, but the the difficult character. And so giving him, you know, getting an insight into into what his past is like and his all, all this stuff, things things make a lot more sense, you know. And his his antagonism towards Aaron that he had early on, all of that uh, becomes a lot more clear. Well, and the. Um... The whole, the whole thing with, uh, like, he's also the most in danger of becoming, sort of, a, just like a really common science fiction stereotype. Do you know what I mean? Like the, yeah, the warrior definitely. race guy. The warrior um, race. Yeah. Yes. So, so it, this kind of really balances him out. In fact, I think in the next episode, there's even a reference to that with those. Um, I forget what they're called, the blood tracker people. One of them, I think, <laughs> yeah. was named Worf. Worf. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, it felt like, it felt following this episode, that was like a conscious decision to kind of invoke the name of Worf. Um, yeah, but, well, both, the, both of these episodes are, uh, are are notable episodes for Dargo, definitely. Um, but yeah, I, I liked the episode. I, I, thought, I thought it was very, very well done. I also thought there were a lot of, chemistry moments between sun and Crichton. i felt like it, it, it looked I, to me... oh go yeah, ahead i've got that in my notes yeah. definitely that was something i was going to bring up it's uh yeah they're very i mean oh well, it starts the episode with him holding her up on his shoulders while she's like repairing the thing i mean they're like literally in physical contact when the episode opens well and and, and i don't want to get too deep into the next episode yet but just because it's relevant to this point in the next episode he does call her his mate and he yeah. even says she's, you know, she's one of his mates, which is <laughs> not untrue. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it kind of, uh, so I feel like, um, I, I, I feel like it looks to me like what's going on is she is starting to have feelings. Well, she's always kind of had feelings for him. I think, um, at least going back to the episode That's... where, uh, I forget there was a point in the past where that seemed to be the case. And well, I feel she, she, I mean, the, uh, in the, in the, the, 
uh, PK Tech Girl episode. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's it, that's where it becomes apparent. But even then, she her confession there, her her semi confession there is that she. Oh well, back when I first got to know you, I did. There was something back then, yeah. you know. And so it's like it, it implies there was always, always an interest there. And uh, and I think um, I think now he's maybe over PT Tech Girl enough that uh, uh-huh. you know, though that could always be something that they bring back into this to the show to to complicate things. But uh, I, I feel like it, it. And also, he kept mentioning. Well, this is the next episode, but he does keep mentioning the offer that he made of her going back with him to earth. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, but again, that was very light stuff cause it was all kind of in between them handling like the super glue subplot. Um, but, uh, yes, but I thought it was interesting. Yes. And, yeah. And of course we, we also, speaking of Aaron too, we've got the fact that she, she still has this residual stuff left over from her pilot transformation too. And pilot is knocked out by Moya. She is, she's the one who goes, Oh yeah. I, yeah, I get how this stuff all works. <laughs> you know, that, it's um, it's 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 one of those interesting kind of. You know what it reminds me of actually is how characters sometimes develop in wuxia stories because of the uh-huh. the way that it's also ability based and like it's almost like you're programming somebody. Like there are literally scenes where somebody will put their finger on a person's forehead and they'll transmit the kung fu information. Yeah. To them, you know, so I know. No, I'm glad to hear you say that because I'm watching so much wuxia because of the podcast mm-hmm. that I'm seeing like wuxia things here and there in like this show and i'm like is it because it's there or is it just because i'm watching so much wuxia that i'm just seeing wuxia everywhere i don't know anymore it's uh yeah, but, I, mean, yeah. I, I don't know how i don't know how i don't think it would have been a deep influence on this show i can't i'm not i don't like, think it would yeah. be no I, that's what i was just saying but I'm, I'm i'm glad i'm just i'm just glad you're seeing the same things i'm yeah. seeing even even if you're as deluded as i am it's uh <laughs> but it's interesting that it's a similar type of character development, it's sort of this ability-based character development that you can only have in like a sci- in a science fiction or a fantasy type show. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have that kind of thing occur in a in a police drama. Do you know what I mean? Somebody's not going to, you know, yeah. get a cybernetic implant and suddenly have all these abilities. <laughs> um, but, no. But yeah, it's interesting how Crichton is becoming uh, a little more ruthless too at this point too. I mean, he's he's all for cutting Moyes. You know, there's there's not a lot of difficulty. Obviously, once he knows about the baby, he goes swings a hundred percent. But I mean, I think I think when they're when I think he's the first one that's like just like cut him. You yeah. Know, uh, when it's when it comes down to it, I was and surprised I, I don't by think, his. I don't think first episode Crichton would have done that. I was very surprised by his determination there and his certainty on the matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think this carries over to the next episode. Um, yeah, well, that's why I brought it up. I, I think it's it's a progression. It's not it's not an anomaly. We're like, well, they just wrote the character wrong in this episode. It's, it's definitely a conscious development. I think. Did um Did you have anything further on this episode, or are you ready to dive into the next one? Ah, I think I'm ready to dive into the next one. Yeah. Okay. So, so that one, uh, I guess. What, what's the, uh, what's the rundown of this one? Ah, this one. Uh, they they're on, they're uh, orbiting a planet that uh, where there's a uh, solar solar flares going on, which is of course something that was happening when Crichton first got shot through the wormhole in the first place. So. He is a uh, well. For one thing, he's he's added all these Moya components to the Farscape, which is his ship, actually, not just the title of the show. So it's it's now a much more functional spaceship than it used to be. Uh, but yeah, they, he uh, ends up setting off solar flares in the ship with Aaron, and uh, and seems really eager to kind of go through this wormhole, even though Aaron's on board and has no interest. <laughs> And being shot through a wormhole, which uh, creates a lot of tension between them, uh, or, which is fair enough. And uh, and uh, but, but yeah, his ship is damaged uh, through that, so they're forced to go down to the planet get it repaired. Uh, and there's also a beacon there, a wanted beacon, which is drawing bounty hunters, which uh, gives gives a warning. Uh, uh, well, wanted uh, announcement for the rest of the crew, not 
Crichton and not Aaron, but everyone else is uh, listed in it. And so then they get involved with the bounty hunters. So that's that's kind of the setup. I do what do you to, think of this? So just getting back to the subject of Crichton's development as a character, I did start to think in terms of the um, the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant when I was watching this episode. Not that I think we're going to get the levels of stuff that was going on in those books. I don't know how familiar you are with those, but, but this I idea, am not actually. Uh, so, I mean, vaguely, I've heard of them. Okay, but, but I mean, basically, like, it seems like he's this interloper from from Earth, right, who's gone into this world. That, for, for, this, uh, it might as well be a fake world to him. Do you know what I mean? Where yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I feel like in, uh, in, 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 in the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, I believe that's sort of one of the core... It's been ages since I read it, but if I recall... I have heard that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the core things, is like, how much moral weight do your actions have in this, you know, you know, fantastic world? And I feel like it's sort of like the thing that maybe happens to people that travel to other places where they're just completely removed from their own culture and put in another, and they might do bad things while they're there. I'm wondering if mm -hmm. him being away from Earth is causing him to either lose his moral center or not perceive all of the human beings that are around him as human beings. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, I mean, obviously these aren't humans, but like they're, 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 they're persons. Do you know what I mean? I, uh, I, I think it's a little more complicated than that because I mean, obviously early on, he was very much kind of the do-gooder character yeah. in the early episodes. So it's, I mean, well, I, I think it's different than the covenant thing. I mean, I don't think it's a case of him not, uh, not perceiving people as real or, or that kind of thing or thinking it's a fantasy world so much. But I think I think you're on to something with the idea of when people are in a very different culture, they can kind of become unmoored yeah. to an extent yeah. and it can lead to them doing things they wouldn't do. I think I think you're on you're on target with that. Definitely. Well and I feel like maybe he's thinking that whatever happens here doesn't necessarily follow him back to Earth. Do you know what I mean? Like like, That's I don't know, true, yeah. like, because what he did was, I mean, that was pretty terrible. Like, that was a pretty, uh, if I were her, I would have been really, really pissed off from that. Yeah, uh, the, well, she is. She yeah. is clearly, what, and that, that brings me to an interesting thing in this episode is, because I mean, one of the things about the episode is kind of the pack dynamics when they're dealing with the uh, blood tractors, but Aaron has talked about comradeship, you know, how she's very loyal to Pilot because he's a comrade. At the same time, she's kind of, you know, she's kind of, so she's kind of, even though she, she's kind of dismissive of Crichton's kind of act, the second they get down to Earth and they're dealing with furlough, it's like, you know, they're dealing with an out, you know, furlough's the mechanic repairing the ship. Yeah. And Aaron is 100% has his back on getting that ship fixed so they can get out there and look at those flares. It's like, she can be furious at Crichton, but when you're dealing with an outsider, boom, yeah. she, she just closes ranks in an instant. Well, she goes along with a crazy plan with the blood tracker. She just, she is, she, she basically just, well, you know, will always work with her, with her comrades, even when she's angry at them. And, and Crichton gets himself into this situation with the blood trackers where they capture <laughs> Dargo and they, and he almost needs to prove to them that he's gonna, uh, you know, willing to interrogate Dargo by hurting him. And in fact, yeah. what he does is he actually helps Dargo, but, uh, but like Argo wasn't very appreciative for no, some reason. No, not. <laughs> uh, but it's it's not this like I don't know my so here was my thinking in that scene. I was like, they just gave you a knife. Use the knife on the on the blood trackers. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like release Dargo and stab one of them. That would be my my game plan in that moment. Um, uh -huh. And so, granted, he might have just had he might have just weighted the probabilities different than I did. And decided on what he thought. Well, it was the most... is, you know, it is, it is made clear the blood trackers are physically fairly dangerous. I mean, so you know, no. his, his ability to, to brawl with one, even with a knife, might, be, especially two of them, could be uh, could be tricky. No, I agree, but at the same time, he's not a small guy. He's got he's a pretty no, he guy. He's got a knife, and he must have a way of getting Dargo off of that thing in a moment. Do you know what I mean? Like. Uh, you know, even if he just has to say, okay, unbind him so I can do X to him. Do you know what I mean? There must be, there, I, I, I could see a number of, uh, of ruses, but, uh, yeah. um, but he does end up doing what seems to be the right thing at the moment. I just, I just, I just, at the, at, as I was watching it, I kind of was rooting for certain other actions to occur. 
Well, I, yeah, I think I think it's fair to say Crichton does not do the right thing at a lot of points in this episode. Yeah, it's, yeah. And that's and it, it's what makes it interesting because I mean I think you know because I can remember earlier in the season you were talking about yeah you're really interested in all the characters but not that interested in Crichton. I feel this is the part of the season where Crichton starts to drift a bit and he becomes a much more interesting character the further he goes from being the good guy who always wants to do the right thing <laughs> yeah I, I i am finding that i am uh i am um i i was i was very intrigued by the recent developments i mean also i i it's it's a little hard to judge because this is like his central thing this is his getting back home ticket so i would expect a character to deviate a little bit from their normal uh moral framework in yeah. those moments well uh, it's it's it, i mean the previous episode we reviewed you know, going two episodes back was the mad scientist episode. And it's, you know, Crichton's just standing in judgment as everyone else acts horrible, trying to get their ticket home. And it's like, cause he has no, he had neither he nor Aaron have any stakes in the game at all. And there, you know, it's like now Crichton is put in this position and he comes so close to doing the wrong thing. <laughs> so it does seem like there are a lot of ethical themes starting to emerge in the show. And yeah. so I'm very interested to see where those go. Um, hopefully it won't be like a 24 type thing where we get like the same ethical theme over and over and over again. Um, no, but, not really. Okay. I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say they, uh, they, 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 they fall into a rut with that, but it's, uh, <laughs> but, uh <laughs> yeah, every, every week, every week, somebody has an opportunity to, to go home that requires them to screw <laughs> everyone over, turns it, turns it to Gilligan's Island basically. <laughs> and, uh, Oh, I'm going to get home this week. Oh no. This episode actually, one thing I did like about it was it really reminded me, this is a show about a guy who's lost in another world. And I just, I mean, I just feel like something about that, that thread of the show has, there's like a deep nostalgia with a lot of stuff that I must've been watching as a kid in like the seventies and early eighties. Cause I feel like a lot of the programming that I watched at that time, I don't remember the shows specifically. I just remember yeah. watching a lot of cartoons and a lot of shows that are vaguely science fictiony or fantasy like that were about this concept of being lost and having to get back home and 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 you would frequently have episodes where a person is like on the cusp of getting back home but something something it was it was a real lost. heavy trope in the yeah. 70s and yeah. 80s i mean yeah you got land to the lost yeah. for example i mean, about gilligan's island there's the D D cartoon yeah. dungeons and dragons cartoon yep. where there it's like yeah i I mean that that's the thing I was I was a little wary of this show at first for the standpoint that I'd seen that trope so much but this show I think does, handles it very yeah. well I I don't think it uh, it does it doesn't use it as a cookie cutter template for every episode well, it's just a theme running through the show And the core problem with that that premise is obviously that the moment that it happens, the show is over or it could be over unless yeah. they're able to work the material in a new way. So, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, but, but what I find is I'm just, again, I kind of file it under the way that the show is good at evoking certain feelings by referencing things. I just sort of got a vague feeling of, Oh yeah, I remember being a kid and watching these shows that were kind of like this. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't, yeah. and it wasn't even any specific show. I couldn't like, I, I just had a vague image in my head of something that was probably a cartoon that I must've watched as a kid, you know? Um, but, uh, and in fact, it, maybe it was a D and D cartoon. I don't remember. Yeah, like lots of HR puff and stuff. I think it's about a kid who's whisked off to this fantasy world and can't get back. So, yeah, there's just it was just it was just I think it's probably the most common trope that was going on when I was a kid. And but uh, what did you think of Furlough? That was kind of an unusual character. The Furlough. Oh, Furlough is a great character. I, I think she was uh, just yeah, uh, yeah. Magda Shubansky who played her just. Uh, just nailed that part. I mean, she she's, I mean, and I, I like I like the ambiguity. You know, it's like it's it seems pretty clear to me that 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 thief that you know she, that, that attacks Aaron that she ultimately ultimately kills herself using the uh, using <laughs> using a you know so whatever she used she clubbed him with something, but uh, it, it it seems pretty clear to me that she hired that thief herself. But, uh, you know, it's like, oh, oh, I got to got to silence this guy. Bonk. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want him talking. No, she, I mean, I, I was very intrigued by her interest in the wormhole. That was, um, you know. Yeah. I thought that was yeah. a cool part of the episode. Uh, I, I, it's funny because when, when he went over to, when she said that uh, uh, Furlough 
uh, needed to, they needed to square the bill away and that she wanted him to handle it. I assume the because she had expressed interest in his physical attractiveness earlier in the episode. I assumed it was going to be one of those kind of things. We're like, yeah, you know, you gotta, yeah. nope, you got to make love to this this mechanic woman, and uh, and and it was it was not that she wanted his wormhole information. Um, yeah, and exclusively, it's yeah. like, yeah, no, you don't get to keep it. I, I want exclusive rights. And she even said it's, it's not like it's not those pretty eyes or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. The show, the show knew it was teasing yeah. you with that possibility by by saying that it wasn't. A, yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it was, it was definitely playing with the concept. But yeah, I I, uh, I think I think Furlo Furlo was a was a great supporting character in this episode. And I like the blood trackers. I like that you didn't know that one of them was female until she said she was female. Um, mm-hmm. That, it surprised me. And then I was like, oh yeah, I can see that's a female. Like it was sort of like, <laughs> but, but it's like this, the, the makeup disguised it enough that I couldn't yeah. really see the femininity. But then once I saw it, I was like, okay, yeah, I can see it now. Um, and I thought that was kind of a cool way to reveal like a, a, new, a new species of alien that we haven't encountered yet. Or at least I don't remember encountering. No, um, we have not encountered them before. And and just to put it, they both kind of look like Ronnie James Dio. That's sort of like they both kind of have sort of a, <laughs> yeah. a, 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 an appearance. Um, yeah, yeah, I can see that. But uh, yeah, and I mean the other uh, other thing that's interesting here is the uh, uh, you know basically Craig's been trying to become friends with Dargo through the whole series and failing, and then he just hits on another tag. Hey, let's form an alliance, and it's like Dargo's like. Okay, now you're now you're speaking my language, which, which is kind of interesting. Because you look back at at Dargo through the series, and he's he's always he's actually even though he was initially very hostile to Aaron, he and Aaron tend to work pretty well together yeah. through almost every episode because they're both just military people. And like, yeah, we're working together, and it's yeah. like when Frank says, "Let's just work together as an alliance," and he's like, "Okay," and suddenly for the first time in the series, Darko and Crichton are able to actually get along you yeah. know when, when he takes a different tack no yeah no definitely i uh um i thought that was a cool uh like a, it was, i don't know is that gonna well i shouldn't ask you but like i'm assuming that that's gonna sustain a little bit for the for, for the show that there will be you know that'll continue to uh to be a thing but i i, I was intrigued when dargo said like friends are not easily made or something like that. Like friendship is obviously friendship, friendship is a lot to ask. Yeah. That's what it says. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, what I took from that was maybe for Luxon's friendships, either for Luxon's friendship is like a much more meaningful thing that like, you know, you don't just, they don't just befriend people, you know, casually, yeah. or he was sort of rebuking Crichton for taking the idea, the concept of friendship lightly. Um, you know yeah um, well it's it's a common it's it's a common thing in a lot of a lot of cultures that you know americans for example are too generous with friendship i mean it's something that the you know because i you know i mean it, it, you know they, they thought actually well well i know you we're friends yeah. and it's like no that's not that's <laughs> not how friendship works you know you know my name doesn't mean we're friends mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, it, it, it's something that makes sense for Crichton to have as a trait that he, uh, you know, just automatically assumes, let's be friends, and, and it doesn't work for him. So I've seen I've seen that play out before in the real world. <laughs> no, no, but, that's, uh, and, 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 and like you said, it is an Australian show, and Crichton is like the American, and so he's the actor, is the, is the American in the cast, right? So, um, yeah. yeah. He, he's an American, correct? Yeah, he is. The actor is American. He actually, though, he uh, he studied acting in London. He went to a really prestigious acting school in London. His wife's English, so he's okay. got kind of a complicated background. But, uh, okay, but he's an but, but he, he is American. American. Um, but yeah, no, I found I found that interesting, and 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 that probably kind of explains some of my reaction to it because I was a little bit puzzled at first when 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 Dargo was so sort of like friendship is a lot to ask, um, but I. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I found it to be a an interesting interaction, and um, and also I liked how it played out in the battle. I liked that you know that that then we sort of saw the effects of that conversation as they were fighting. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and now, now the battle scene at the end is good. It's uh, 
I mean, the uh, I, I like I like the way that uh, Crichton one more time tries to do his tough guy act to go over and browbeat the blood truck, and they're just not having it anymore. They're like, no, no. <laughs> yeah, his whole Butch <laughs> Cassidy and the Sundance out. Kid thing that he had going. Yeah, um, exactly. It's like no, Crichton, Crichton tries to trick one time too many, and it's just not going to happen. I did like that at least he managed to tie the cultural reference to Sun's name. Do you know what I mean? There is at least like a yeah, you're right. Phonetic, you're right. I didn't like, actually pick yeah. up on that, yeah. but uh... <laughs> I, mean, I mean, maybe they didn't need. Maybe they weren't trying to do it. Maybe I'm reaching, but like I felt like that was there, um, and so I thought that was at least smooth uh, as as references go. Um, and also, I have an uncle Butchie, so I like you know like okay. you know, being called Butch. A certain thing comes to mind when uh, when I when I when I hear that name. But uh, but yeah, no, was, I thought I thought this was a this was a decent episode. I think I liked the previous one better, but this was still a good episode. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, I mean the, the obviously the the first episode is uh, you know they've got a secret. It's 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 a huge episode in the series. You get yeah. Dargo's background and Moya's pregnant now, which of course. Even it even carries into this episode. The reason why Crichton can't take his ship on board Moya is because the chemicals it's leaking. Moya's like, "Oh, you can't have that near my baby." So, <laughs> also that does bring us to the whole photogasm thing because that was something. That oh was, yes, yes, the whole other element. Yes, um, that was weird. Uh, so basically, Zahn's species is like aroused by sunlight is that or like certain levels of radiation there, or I, i'm not gonna say anything now there's there's another detail that will make it make a little more sense in the future okay. so um, <laughs> it's uh but uh yeah yeah I, I i don't know that it needs to be a big secret but i'll keep it a secret okay for now. but uh but yeah, yeah, and, uh, and the setting on this too, we got to remark the uh, the dunes where they shoot is a really uh, is really a evocative uh, was, setting. I think was, they do a good job with that. Well, it was both sort of Star Wars and Dune kind of came to mind. Um, I was sure. thinking more Star Wars because of the way that the uh, uh, the way that everything was sort of presented looked kind of Star Warsy to me. It looked like that sort of dirty, grungy space sort of. Location. Yeah, I, I, I got a very heavy metal magazine vibe off it, too, like in the establishing shot of the place and everything. So it, it uh, and, uh, yeah, it, it, it was, I mean, definitely, definitely Star Wars was clearly part of what they were evoking. But uh, it could not, it could not have been comfortable to shoot in that location with prosthetic stuff stuck all over your face, I've got to say. No, I don't know. <laughs> But I don't. But the thing is, the thing that they didn't have that would have maybe made it feel more like Dune was sort of an emphasis on the scarcity of water. I don't really remember that being a, um, a no thing. Uh, no, I don't think that. But uh, but yeah, no. It was. It, I thought I thought it was a fine episode. Um, and I just I I don't know how I feel about the term photogasm. That was sort of a, a yeah. A, that's a little uh, a little on the on the cheesy side there. No question. Um, but uh, but but other than that, you know. It was, it, interesting episode and I'm, I'm i'm definitely curious to see where this pregnancy with a ship goes that's yeah not something i think i've seen in a show before so i i i can't can't think of anything no but uh yeah but speaking of language though and terminology i i do i do enjoy just how much zon and rigel um, how much they enjoy explaining to Dargo, you know, what, what pain in the ass means to him. They just, <laughs> Ross Rigel especially. Yeah, it's, no, well, I, yeah, no, I, I, they, they do seem to be picking up on human stuff pretty quickly, too, I've noticed, especially Zahn and Rigel. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, uh, yeah, that, that is something that carries on through the show. But yeah, so I think, uh, what, what's our, what, what do we have coming up next on the, uh, uh, on the horizon, the next two episodes will be... This looks like uh, a real title, too, for an episode. Rhapsody in Blue yeah. and and The Flax are the next two episodes. All right. The Flax, I already have misgivings about just based on the name, but I've learned that with this show, that's not a very good indicator of <laughs> what you're about yeah. to get. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but the word gloppet comes to mind when I see The Flax. 
The um, word what? Glop it. Remember glop it? In, uh, oh, glop in, it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, going back to the uh, the glop it egg, yeah. I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. In fact, no. I remember my note was glop it, make it, stop it. That was sort of my... <laughs> that, was, that, yeah. that term will never leave your head because you wrote that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's... No, that's... Uh, I, I, I see where you're coming from. But, but, uh, but Rhapsody in Blue has me intrigued. Yeah. Um, Though, again, I've really learned to not pay as much attention to titles in this show because of what you told me. Um, though I think the blood Till the Blood Runs Clear was a really good way to frame that episode because that that do, that really does draw your attention to that It's a scene good and, title. Yeah. It's a good title in any case. Even I mean, even if... Uh, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who doesn't even watch the show, and he's like, ooh, that's a really good title. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even if you don't know what that means, it sounds meaningful, doesn't it? Till the blood runs clear. Like, if, if, if somebody asks you anything to do about time, and that's the response, it's a very dramatic sort of thing to say. Uh, exactly, yeah, no, so that's, uh, yeah, I, I mean, but the, but, the, uh, but no, the, the next two episodes, yeah, we've actually only got uh, four episodes till we kind of move into, uh, oh, wait, no, actually, I, I'm, I'm confused, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, we're moving along pretty quickly, though. Oh, I get what you're saying. There's like a, um, there's a series of two parters or something. Is that what? Uh... Yeah, yeah. There is a, uh, there, there is basically the, the series. The, the, the episodes become increasingly uh, uh, more more connected as mm. the season moves forward. Okay. Um, yeah. So you know, I, I think we'll we'll be back with those episodes, and uh, I think on Friday we're doing return, no, not return. We're doing uh, Shaolin Thirty Six Chamber. And um, or 36 Chamber of Shaolin. And I know we have other things lined up, like uh, A Moment of Romance and um, that Chinese ghost story episode of Wuxia Workshop. So, uh, so we got plenty on the horizon. And uh, until then, we will talk to you later. Mm-hmm.